Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. So welcome to our uh, seminar today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Solodel Villa uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Mathematics and Statistics to give us a talk today. Um, Professor uh, Solodel Villa received uh, her PhD in Mathematics in 2017 from UT Austin and was later a research fellow at UC Berkeley and a, a more Sloan Research Fellow at NYU. Her honors and awards include uh, delivering a commencement speech at UT Austin, representing her graduating PhD class in 2017, and the Fulbright Fellowship. And she also was named as a recent stars in computational and the data sciences in 2019. Her research has been funded by many, many agents, including NSF, Simons Foundation, ORNR, and EOARD, etc. So, uh, Sorodel, please. Well, thank you so much for the, for the invitation and for the introduction. So today I'm going to talk about um, some work that I've been doing in the past year, um, some different papers or maybe even uh, earlier than that, about equivariant machine learning. So this is research that I've done with several people. I think the, the main part of the talk is going to be about work that I did with David Hogg, who is uh, an astrophysicist, uh, astrophysicist. So it's like an um, interdisciplinary collaboration with physics. And Kate is uh, David's PhD student. Wei Chi Yao is a PhD student at NYU who did most of the uh, implementations and the numerical um, experiments of, that I'm going to show you. And then Blooms, uh, Ben Bloom Smith, is um, is going to join uh, my group as a postdoc um, soon. He's an invariant theorist. He's a pure mathematician. And Bianca Dumitrascu, who works in computational biology and has uh, interesting applications for these kind of problems. So um, please ask me questions. I have the iPad here, so I can uh, I don't know can write things if you if you have questions. And yeah, it's uh, we can make it a little bit interactive. So, okay, so the context of this talk is machine learning and in particular machine learning that are equivalent with respect to some symmetry. So machine learning algorithms that respect symmetries. And the reason why I'm thinking about um, symmetries is because they give some nice structure that allows machine learning models to learn with the right inductive bias, meaning that Deep learning uh, has been very successful for many problems. And I believe that there's two main components for deep learning success. One, the first component is the fact that it's over-parameterized. So you have too many parameters and that's some very different kind of point of view than the classical machine learning approaches. And at least that's something that if not key is like something that is very specific of deep learning. And the other thing that that they have and is key for the success is that you have the right structure, the right architecture. And these architectures, I may argue, that encode the symmetries of the problems that one tries to solve and the symmetries of the data sets. So for instance, convolution neural network are said to exploit some certain some certain sim symmetries that are existing in natural images. So, for instance, by applying the same filters in different patches of the image, you obtain some form of um, um, inexact approximate symmetry that then is exploited. And um, for instance, recurrent neural networks exploit some sort of time translation symmetry. Uh, in text by applying the same recurrent units at different parts of locations of the text. And so that's one form of thinking about what, what structure are we using and are we exploiting certain symmetries. And um, one of the graph, uh, one of the neural networks that the models that has been studied a lot in the past years is this graph neural networks, which basically define machine learning models on graphs. And those have to encode certain symmetries that have to do with the representations of graphs. So if you're having a graph like this, then um, 
you want that if you have a graph and you represent this as an adjacency matrix, the representation of the graph as an adjacency matrix is not unique. It depends on the order that you give the nodes in the matrix. So um, if you want to write a function of the graph, then that function needs to be invariant with respect to what order I give to the nodes in the graph or equivariant in a sense. So the idea is one way you can do that. So you write um, a function on graphs that is independent on the ordering of the nodes is by implementing message passing neural networks, which basically are based on every, uh, every node sends a message to their neighbors and they aggregate the messages. So in that sense is independent of the order because every node does the same thing. This is one way of thinking of it as weight sharing because every uh, message function is the same. The functions are the same. What is different are the inputs. So the fact that you use the same function everywhere, you can think of it as a form of like weight sharing. Um, but before I go into the details of graph neural networks, I'm going to define what I want to, what I mean when I say invariance or equivariance. So I'm talking about exact symmetries here. So the idea is that we have a group, say the group of permutations, and this group adds, adds on the on a data set X, and we say that a function f f from X to Y is invariant if and only if for every group element and every data point f of g times x is equal to f of x. So the function doesn't change when I apply the group action to the input. And if the group also acts in the codomain of the function, we say that the function is equivariant if for all g and all x, f of g times x is equal to g times h of x. Right. So if you uh, apply a transformation to the input, then you have to apply a transformation by the same group action on the output. So as an example, I can show you these like uh, dynamical systems particle simulations when we have like n particles here in this in this uh, ball and um, these particles are uh, the, the learning model uh, the, is to predict what is the trajectories of these particles uh, on with time. And so we can say that given the initial conditions, which are the positions and the momentums of the particles, I can predict the trajectories. But if I apply a rotation to my inputs, then the predictions should rotate in the same way. Right. So if I start with this, I have some predictions, then I rotate, then the prediction should rotate in the same way. This is because the the, the trajectories depend on this um, like particles interactions and these interactions if you rotate the the system then the interactions rotate in the same way so the prediction should be equivariant and that's one example of what do I want so the idea is I'm going to do machine learning for this for this dynamical system and I'm going to constrain my machine learning model so that the predictions that it produces have this symmetry. So if I apply, apply a rotation to the input, then the output rotates in the same way, for instance. Another example of equivariance is what I was talking to you about the graph. So we started with this graph. We write the adjacency matrix uh, in this way, but we could have also written an adjacency matrix where, where the yellow uh, and the green we're in the opposite order, like here. And, and so if I'm looking for, say, the length of the shortest path that visits every node, that function is invariant. This, this, this is a real output, it's a number. And so if I apply a transformation to the matrix, um, then the F doesn't change. But if I'm looking for the path that visits every node, then I know that if I um, if I do this this change, then the path 
should change in the same way. The output should, should change in the same way. So the, in this case, we say that it's equivariant. And we know that the action in the input is different from the action in the output, but it's the action by the same group. So here, the action of permutations on matrices is by conjugation, and, the, and, the, and in the output, the action is by multiplication. But that's fine because it's the same group acting, and you can define how they act in different spaces. Okay, so these are my two examples of uh, invariance and equivariance. Please, this is, if you have any question about this, let me know. So the idea is that we want to parameterize the functions that have those properties. Um, one example of functions that have these properties are spectral methods. Like if we have a graph or a matrix um, read, written like this, then if I take the eigenvectors of that matrix, these eigenvectors have the property that if I apply a permutation in rows and columns, the eigenvectors had the same permutation applied. Like, and so that um, justifies algorithms like spectral clustering. And you can use this idea to define some form of graph in a network that is different from the message passing idea that I told you earlier, but also has this equivalent property. The idea is that if you have a graph G, this graph has an adjacency matrix A, which is an M by N matrix, then we can construct a set of operators M that depend on A by adding like the identity and degree and powers of the adjacency matrix. And then we can learn a linear combination of these operators coming from M, uh, from A, sorry. And so uh, this delta, which is a kind of like an ex like a form of Laplacian that is um, learned from data, that you can learn it from data, has the property that if I apply a permutation to the rows or the columns then of A, then M will have the same permutation and then it's equivalent by design. And you can use this to define some form of graph in a network that iterates, uh, that emulates the uh, power iteration on this, this Laplacian. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if you want to discuss it, if you have questions, we can we can discuss it later. Can, can I, so, can um, I, yes. Can I clarify, just sort of clarification? So, so the mm -hmm. domain you 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 uh, care about, or in this context, is always like a graph, or could be like continuous. The group is always discretized, or could be a comeback to group. Or, or... Ah, great question. Uh, so in this example, it was just a graph, but actually in the in in the next um, so in these graphs, then the group is the group by, of permutations, which yeah. is discrete. But my my examples in this talk are going to be, or like the the main parts of these talks are going to be about symmetries in physics, and these symmetries are by continuous groups. So the, the we're going to discuss the orthogonal group, the rotations, translations, and rotations, the Lorentz group. Um, and Poincaré group and permutations. So these groups, uh, so these groups are um, compact, mm -hmm. but they are continuous. Uh, this group is not compact, but it's fine. We is is not going to be too complicated. The Lorentz group is also not compact, but um, it behaves like a, like the orthogonal group. It comes from like some form of inner product. And, and then the other groups that I will discuss later on are the groups of um, uh, the, the groups of scalings to define units equivalence. And these ones are not compact and they have a little bit, they're a little bit more complicated. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is that we, we are using these models to do predictions in physical systems and these physical systems obey um, some symmetries just because physics obeys symmetries. So, okay. So, so then it makes sense to incorporate the symmetries into the design of the models because just that is part of the, the world satisfies the symmetries, if that makes sense. So this is like the correct inductive bias because you know that the, the, that these problems will satisfy physical symmetries. It is another important question 
to when you don't know what symmetries your models, your data should satisfy, how to learn the symmetries from data and then apply something. But from now, in this talk, we assume that we know what the symmetries are. Um, something, uh, some interesting, important, fundamental result is that is uh, no other uh, theorem that says that every differential symmetry uh, generated by local actions corresponds to a conservation law. So that's something that. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's something that that we are going to use into the um, in we could use into the design of the uh, of the equivariant machine learning. Uh, so, and that has to do with the next slide, uh, how symmetries are implemented. So classically, or, or like I guess that the machine learning, uh, the way people uh, implement symmetries is by doing data augmentation. So basically you take your data set and if you know that if you have this, um, this uh, particle simulation and you rotate the particles, the, the system should rotate accordingly, then you can add the rotation of your training set and the rotated predictions to your training and then have a larger training set where you do the learning. That has like two advantages. The advantage of like adding more data is always useful because these um, machine learning models are very data hungry. They need a lot of data to be trained. So just adding that would be useful. And the second is like, well, you think that by adding that, you would expect that your system learns the symmetries from the data. Um, we're not going to do that, but that's that's a very interesting direction, and people do that all the time. Another thing that we can do is we can do loss function penalties by imposing the the symmetries, uh, like thinking that we can impose the symmetries by having some penalization for this. By, for these quantities that we know are conserved, you know, no other theorems. Another way uh, you can do it is by imposing the exact symmetries in the design of the machine learning architecture. So you restrict the class of functions that you're learning to the functions that satisfy the symmetries. That is what people do, for instance, with message passing or what we uh, discuss about the spectrum methods that encode the symmetries already. And there are many ways to do this. And there's many, like, there's a lot of people that work on this and I'm having, like, I have some names here, but there's, um, there's way more. There's a lot of things that are going on in this space. One of these ideas is um, parameterize symmetry preserving functions using irreducible representations and imposing symmetries as, as constraints, group convolutions, et cetera. Uh, these group convolutions discretize the the group as you as you asked before um, what i'm going to discuss is that an alternative approach that produces exact symmetries doesn't need to discretize the group and is very easy to implement but the disadvantage is that it only works for a small set of groups it doesn't it, it's like defined for like this specific group actions that we care about in physics but um, it's interesting to see or think about how you we can generalize it to other groups. But for now, it's restricted to uh, an important class of groups, but is not 100% uh, general as the other approaches are. So uh, something else that I'm going to mention later in this talk is how much do you gain by imposing these symmetries? Like, what do you gain uh, by imposing these symmetries in the architectural design? And um, you, there's some work, uh, and some of them are mentioning here, Vieti, Alessetti, and May, and collaborators. Uh, these, all these papers are from like 2021, so it's quite recent. And what they do is they quantify how much you gain by imposing the symmetries in terms of generalization error or sample complexity. Assuming that your target function that you want to learn about is actually invariant. Uh, the, the disadvantage of enforcing the symmetries is that um, sometimes enforcing the symmetries can be hard. And when you force the symmetries, you may lose in terms of expressivity because you may say, 
um, that you can, every function that you can express satisfy the symmetries, but not every function that satisfies the symmetries you can express. So it's not like a complete description. And that has to do with the question of universality, and I'm going to discuss that just now. So in particular, this we have this, this work uh, in Europe 2019 uh, that is inspired by a paper by Shu and collaborators in 2019, and also Morris and collaborators in 2019. Both these two papers appear more or less at the same time. And they show that when you do message passing, this message passing neural networks, if you just like implement, implement them in the most naive way possible, they are not expressive enough in the sense that um, if you have this graph A, which is just two triangles, and you have this graph B, which is an hexagon, then for every choice of parameter for your network, F of A is, all, is going to be equal to F of B. So that tells you that these message passing neural networks are not expressive enough to have uh, to be able to distinguish A from B. Uh, there's then after that there were many tricks that people come up with so that uh, to modify these message passing neural networks so that they can distinguish things like that. But a priori, if you do just the most naive message passing implementation, they they cannot do it. And so the question is, well, um, the graph isomorphism problem seems to be a good framework to characterize the expressive power of graph neural networks, uh, because it, the graph isomorphism problem is, is a problem that is, is, is hard to solve. So we don't expect graph neural networks to be able to solve the graph isomorphism problem. And so uh, understanding what non-isomorphic graphs um, the these graph neural networks cannot distinguish is one way of understanding the expressive power of these neural networks. And what we did was we took a bunch of graph neural network architectures and we compare them in terms of like their ability to distinguish non-isomorphic graphs. Um, yeah. And then we extended that result to show that uh, most, if you have like a, a graph neural network based on message passing that doesn't take any node features, you can show that the, the most of the standard in implementations uh, cannot be used to count uh, substructures on the graphs like triangles. They can only count things like star shaped um, ob uh, objects. And so, yeah, so you here you are like imposing this equivariance, but when you impose the symmetry, you get that the function class that you obtained are is not universal. That's the that's the idea. And then not only that it's not universal, but also like functions that you may want to express, like count how many triangles this graph this graph has, or I don't know, squares is something that uh, it cannot be done if if the implementation is like the vanilla implementation. If you want to if you want to do it, then you have to do something smarter. So I think that kind of shows what uh, one possible limitation of this approach. Um, switching gears uh, to a more like general discussion, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how people implement group equivariant architectures for any group. So um, this is based on, there's some paper by Condor in 2018, and then there's a paper by Maron in 2019 where they uh, they call them like group equivariant neural networks. And the idea is that, well, say that you have a neural network, like a standard neural network, like this one, feed forward neural network. So this feed forward neural network is uh, the composition of linear layers with nonlinear activation functions, right? Just you take a linear layer, fully connected, nonlinear activation function, pointwise, linear layer, etc. So if you want to write a function in that form that is equivalent with respect to some group action, then you want that f 
has the property that f of q times v is equal to q times f of b for all b and all q. So, um, if you if you re if one way of doing this, it would be to restrict the linear layers to have that property. But actually, if you ask for linear equivalent functions, you may find that there are not that many. For instance, with rotations, like no. No linear function is rotation invariant, uh, unless it's just like trivial. So you may want to go to like a higher space so that you can a higher dimension, like a, a larger space so you can have linear functions that are equivalent. So the idea is uh, to extend that to tensors. So instead of consider the, the input space, you, you take a tensor of the input space k times, and then you say that your linear equivalent function takes a tensor and outputs a tensor. And uh, the idea is that you have to extend the action of the group from RD to RD to the K. And the way you extend it is what you would expect. If you have a tensor product, you extend the action of Q in this tensor as Q times B tensor product, et cetera, for each of the components. So it's kind of like you have this tensor and the action is in each of the dimensions of the tensor independently. And, and so then you can ask, how do I parameterize the linear equivalent functions on these tensors? So one idea is by this paper by Finzi and collaborators that they say, okay, this linear equivalent functions on these tensors is the space of linear maps uh, that are equivalent is actually a linear space. So they, what they do is they write a bunch of constraints of this form, like L, um, the, the map L has to satisfy that L of Q times B is equal to Q times L of B. And then they, uh, they solve the, um, they, they write a system of, of linear equations and then they solve the system of linear equations to find a parameterization for that. Does that make sense? So they say, okay, this is a linear space, so we can find a parameterization of this linear space by writing a bunch of constraints and solving a linear system. And that's what they do. Um, more classically, what people do is they use irreducible representations. So basically they say, uh, if you have uh, the linear equivalent maps are in one-to-one -one correspondence between the maps between the representations. So they take the, the, the representations of the group in the tensor space and they, they, re, they decompose them in irreducibles and then they, they match the the, the representations of the spaces to find uh, the equivalent maps. And they, there, there's a paper by Dima Maron that shows that this approach universally approximates all SO3 equivalent functions if the order of the tensor that you are going to, so this K here, uh, can be taken arbitrarily large. So it's, a, it's like a, a form of like stone bias stress theorem that tells you that every function, continuous function can be approximated by polynomials. Uh, so yeah, so that's what they do. So what we, uh, but this is very complicated because you've given this product representation, you have to write the decomposition of that product representation in irreducibles. And in order to do that computationally, you need to compute these klebsch gordon coefficients, which can be hard to compute in some cases. So, I mean, and, but the nice thing of this approach is that it's in, it works in general for any group action. It could be compact or whatever. It could be anything that, that works in general. So what I'm going to present uh, is my work um, in, from NeurIPS 2021, which we, we solved this problem for a special set of groups this rotation, um, parity, and boost uh, in any dimension uh, is, is a simpler uh, idea 
but it's restricted to a case of groups. And this is a paper called Scalars Are Universal, Equivalent Machine Learning, Structural and Classical Physics. And basically the idea is that um, we have a function f, which takes n vectors in Rd and outputs a real output. This function is invariant with respect to, say, rotation, uh, rotations or um, orthogonal transformations, etc. Uh, so basically, if you if you apply this rotation to this input, which means that you rotate each of the vectors with the same rotation, then the output doesn't change. Um, and we want to parameterize the functions that have that property. We also we're also going to parameterize the functions that take n vectors in Rd and output a vector, so that if I rotate the vectors inputs, then the output rotates. And the groups that we are considering are the orthogonal group, uh, the group of rotations, the group of translations, the Euclidean group that includes translations and rotations, the Lorentz group, which uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is a group that shows up in special relativity and is defined as the orthogonal group, but uh, there's this lambda matrix here, which is one and then negative ones. This is lambda. And you have that Q transpose times lambda Q is equal to lambda. So it's in the case of, um, of the orthogonal group, the lambda is just the identity. Then the Poincare group that includes the Lorentz group and translations and then just permutations and the actions that you would are what you would expect. So the rotation acting on all these nodes is rotation of each of the nodes, etc. Um, okay, so this is what we consider in our work. And so the idea of what we're going to do is very simple. What we use these results like classical results by, sorry, by Bile, which is the, the characterization of invariant functions. And in the case of OD, orthogonal group, what this says is that a function that takes n vectors in RD and outputs a real value is OD invariant if and only if you can write it as a function of the pairwise inner products of the inputs. Um, so the idea, so basically a function of n vectors is invariant if and only if with respect to OD, if and only if is a function of the inner products of the inputs. The, the way you prove it is, is very, one way of seeing this is, is very simple. It's just think, say that M is the matrix of inner products. Then you can recover the vectors that produce these inner products by doing something like the Cholesky decomposition. And the, you can recover these vectors up to rotations or up to orthogonal transformations. Uh, so that tells you that, um, that uh, having the inner product suffices to, to create this matrix, this function. Uh, the other direction is easier because if the function is OD invariant, uh, then the inner products don't change when you apply an OD to your inputs. Does that make sense? So in physics terms, this idea can be seen as saying that all scalars can be written in what is called like this Einstein transformation notation. And in the case of the Lorentz group, instead of using the classic, like the standard inner products, you use this Minkowski inner product that is defined as like the time component, the, the, this product of the time components of your vector minus the inner product of the space components. Um, okay, so, so far so good. But how, how about you have a translation? So this is, you have okay. rotation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so this is just rotations. The translations are going to be uh, added later on. 
Okay. But the idea is that you, if, if you want to make a translation invariant, what you can do is you can make your inputs to be centered. Okay. And then you just like take you, it's kind of like some form of pre-processing. You center your, your, if you center your vectors by say subtracting the center of mass, like the average of all the vectors, then that would be a translation invariant. Do you agree? Sure, sure. sure. Uh, and if you want to make it equivariant, you can just add it here. Like you can say this is like a function that is invariant with respect to rotations and then plus something that is, yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll explain that later, but that's sure, the sure, idea. Sure. Yeah. But this is because the translation group is so quite, a, quite a simple, but for general un, un, uncompatible group, you cannot figure out this sort of normalize it like this way, the translation group. So you, you figure out the mean is like normalize it. But for the general, uh, back, it, it, it could be. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about what what to do with the group of, of scalings. Yeah, uh, which is is also non compact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, just one I'm going to mention this in like one second to just say, OK, if you if you're familiar with the literature in like low rank matrix completion, mm -hmm. then you can think about uh, do you need all the inner products to uh, to para parameterize these functions? And the answer is no, because you can reconstruct uh, the you can reconstruct all the inner products by just a, a subsample of them. And this is related with the theory of uh, the rigidity theory of gram matrices and the low rack matrix completion. But yes, uh, next thing uh, that I wanted to discuss is how do you write equivalent vector functions? And so basically what we can prove is that if you have n vectors in Rd, then and the output is in Rd, then the function is equivalent with respect to the orthogonal group. If and only if you can write it as a linear combination of your uh, input vectors with coefficient functions, and these coefficient functions are invariant scalar functions. Mm -hmm. So then that uh, that suggests the following approach, which is universal and is very easy to implement. So given your inputs, these B vectors, compute the scalar products, and then learn these functions F1 through Fn, which are the coefficient functions. And these functions are unconstrained because if it, when you write it in terms of the inner products, any function is invariant. And then you, you, you just compute this F1 through FMs, and then you compute the, your output, and that's it by summing. Um, and this is, this is not hard to prove, uh, but we haven't seen it before. Uh, and the idea, and we can, we can prove that if this H is a polynomial, then these functions FIs can be chosen to be polynomials. Um, then the next thing that that I wanted to discuss. Okay, the translations, that's something, that's what we just asked, you asked me just now, Ronji. Um, how do you do the, the translations? Well, you can just subtract the center of mass to your inputs and uh, and that will give you something that is invariant. And if you want to make it equivalent, you can just add it to the, to, to the previous formulation. Uh, so something that I think is a little bit uh, more interesting is how do you do permutation invariance? in this case. So meaning a function that is OD equivariant and um, permutation invariant. So H of this set of inputs is equal to H of whatever reordering of the input vectors. Uh, the way you do it is by extending the previous characterization that says that a function H is, um, well, this function H is going to be a linear combination of your input vectors times these f's, which is our, these are the coefficient functions that need to be all the invariant. And these functions are going to be the same function for all these vi's. So it's not going to be like depending on the this, it's the same function. But the function is going to be evaluated in vi and everything else. So it's some form of message passing. It's a function of me and everyone else. And everyone else is as a set. So this is like a set. And this idea can be implemented with message passing because it has kind of like the same structure as the message passing. Um, 
Um, so can we generalize this to other groups? Okay, so what would a generalization of this idea would look like to, for other groups? So, and I want to mention that there's this paper, sequence of papers by Gripaius and Haddadin that do something where like they, they have a, a similar approach for, for other groups trying to, to write, um, uh, trying to write a, a characterization of um, equivalent functions using the, the space of in, invariant uh, polynomials, which is what we are doing here. In, in like underlying, what are we doing? We are seeing that uh, if if G is a reductive group, uh, or like say the groups that that we are discussing, the algebra of invariant polynomials uh, is what is called a graded coin macalau algebra, which means that uh, there exists a set of primary invariants with our homogeneous and uh, algebraically independent polynomials and a group of uh, a set of secondary invariants so that every element of your uh, algebra of invariant polynomials can be written as this combination of primary invariants and secondary invariants. Right. So there exists this set of invariants uh, and we can use this set of invariants to parameterize the space of invariant functions, at least for polynomials. But then if you have polynomials, you can extend it to, um, to continuous functions. But the key idea is that in the examples that we were discussing for OD, for instance, if, you, if D is greater than N, uh, we have that the the primary invariants are the scalar products and the secondary invariants are trivial. But in more general groups, what may happen is that the space of invariants, primary invariants and secondary invariants is exponentially large. And then is something that you may not be able to use for parametrizing your invariant functions for, for deep learning, right? So that's what happens in the case of uh, the graph neural networks. Like I cannot write the the primary invariants and the secondary invariants for the for the symmetry of the graph neural networks because it grows like exponentially with the number of nodes in my graph. So the fact that we could do it for these groups is because these primary invariants and secondary invariants were relatively uh, small. The set was relatively small. Um, but yeah, so understanding um, for what groups this characterization is useful for parametrizing the space of functions for machine learning is a, an ongoing problem. So I have some example, um, this that um, numerical example that I wanted to show you. This example is inspired by this paper by Finzi, uh, and, uh, Andrew Wilson and Max Welling where they have this very nice code EMLP that implements this thing that I told you with uh, using the constraints to parameterize the, the space of invariant, the equivalent functions. Um, and we use their code base to reproduce their experiments and add our model and compare against them. So the idea is you have this double pendulum with springs. Uh, this is a Hamiltonian system, meaning that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is conserved. And this conserv conserved quantity is in, a, is in correspondence with the time translation symmetry. And um, basically what we are going to do is we're going to use um, a, a neural ODE and a Hamiltonian neural network to predict the trajectories of this double pendulum. Um, and the idea is that if we take the gravity vector as an input to my system, then the system is going to be O3 equivariant. Because if I if I rotate the pendulum, it's not of it's not true that the rotation uh, the, the the predictions will rotate, but if I rotate the the masses and I also rotate the gravity, then the predictions will rotate. So this is what I'm saying here. 
So this is the position, momentum of the first particle, position, momentum of the second particle, gravity vector and time. This function here is equivalent with respect to all three. And so the way we write this is, for instance, in the case of the Hamiltonian, or the, which is the one that performed better, is like you take your, your input vectors, you compute the scalars, and then from the scalars, you learn a Hamiltonian, which is a, it's a, it's a, it's an invariant function that outputs like just one real value, right? It's the like Hamiltonian is just one scalar. And then uh, you integrate this Hamiltonian and then your predictions are mapped, are, 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 are compared to the truth. And then that's how you train it to the true Hamiltonian. And we observe that actually our model uh, outperformed the, the baseline, which was EMLP. And here we have like some predictions that we show. Uh, okay. Any questions about this? If not, I'm going to uh, move on to like the last two things that I wanted to discuss, the scalings and how much do we gain by imposing the symmetries. So um, there's many ways to quantify how much do you gain by imposing the symmetries. The theoretical framework that I like the most is by Elisari and Sadi from this paper in ICML 2021, because I think that they have like a very clean exposition of what is going on. So here, if you have a group uh, acting in RD, a compact group, uh, and, and then you have your data in RD, which is supported in a, in a group, in a, in a distribution mu, which is invariant with respect to a group action. And so you have your training data, X and then Y, and Y is produced as some target invariant function plus noise. Then uh, if you look at the risk of your, of your model, of your of our function f, which is the expected value on the data sample from the distribution of the prediction given by f minus the truth square, you can that's the risk, and then you can say for a function f, I consider the projection of f onto the space of invariant functions, and I look at the generalization gap, which is the difference between the prediction error by f minus the prediction error by the projected version of f and what this paper shows is that this generalization gap is equal to the norm of f projected onto the orthogonal complement of the space of invariant functions so this is like a mouthful but the fact that they can compute the generalization gap and it's some norm so this tells you that it's greater than zero. And so one of the ways to think about this is to say imposing the symmetries always gives you smaller error, at least in this case, compact group case. And so and this is something that you can quantify. So it's like there's something that you gain and that can be quantified and it's greater than zero. Um, so in the case, uh, in the case that we, that, that we work on um, recently is units equivariance, which is different from this space, that, and this model that, that we just had, because in the, in the case of LSD and Sadie, they require that the group is compact in, and, and what we are looking at is, is uh, this units equivalence uh, corresponds to the group of scalings, which is not compact. And the idea is the following. Uh, in the example of the double pendulum that we had before, we had uh, that there is the potential energy and the kinetic energy, and then there's the Hamiltonian, which was the sum of these two things. And uh, the prediction say that you want to predict the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has units, uh, which can be seen as joules, for instance, you can choose any basis for the units that you want, but say that you're using like the, the standard 
unit system. So kilograms, meters squared divided by seconds squared. So if I take my, my pendulum and then I express every, uh, every mass, uh, instead of expressing it in kilograms, I express it in pounds, then the prediction that I obtain has to be equivalent with respect to that transformation. Say, if I multiply everything that have units of kilograms by five, then the output should transform, multiply by five as well, just because to be consistent with the units. And that you can write it as the predictions being equivalent with respect to scalings. And this group of scalings is, um, is a non-compact group because I can get any, for any real value, I can rescale any of these units by that real value, positive value if you want. So in order to express the functions that are unit equivalent, we use classical dimensional analysis, techniques from classical dimensional analysis, in particular this Buckingham Pi theorem that tells you that if you have a um, if you have a function which is unit equivalent, you can write it in terms of dimensionless features. So the idea is uh, every input in your in your physical system has some units: kilograms, meters, meters by second, etc. So you take all the inputs and then you make a transformation that make each of these inputs dimensionless. So for instance, we had like like um, we had M1, M2, um, I don't know, L1, L2 from your pendulum, well, the things that we have here. So in, in this dimensionless space, I will have like M1 divided by M2, which has no units, uh, L1 divided by M2, etc. And from that, these dimensionless features, we construct a neural network and we learn a function on the dimensionless features that produces a dimensionless label, and then there is a scaling that produces the dimensional output. And with this approach, we, we show that actually, uh, even though the performance may be a little bit harder to get, like it may be a little hard to get good performance on these dimensionless features, because the fact that you're dividing things make it that uh, it may be hard to uh, work with it um, in terms of uh, numerical instability. If things get close to zero, then you should not divide them, etc. What we obtain is that uh, it performs really well in out of distribution generalization. The idea is that if you have uh, that your masses are sampled from like uniform zero one when you do this transformation. Um, and then if you're in your training, your, 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 your masses say in, in the training set M1 and M2 are like from uniform, like say zero one, and in your test M1 and M2 are from a distribution you know, uniform zero, like a thousand, the distribution of M1 divided by M2 Uh, for both uh, is the same. So this allows you to generalize, like it allows you to train in this space and test in this space and still perform well, which is what this experiment two does. And this is like, this plot shows. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so this shows that you can do predictions like yeah, like when you when you do the when you do this transformation from here to here, and this is not exactly what we do with this experiment, but but it's close. Uh, the baseline that has very bad error, but the but the dimensionless doesn't doesn't see it because the way it constructs the features allows you to be able to generalize to these uh, out of distribution examples. So um, I think I'm ending on time.
I talked about enforcing exact symmetries in machine learning models that produces better sample complexity and small generalization error. Um, in particular, I talked about graph neural networks and symmetries in classical physics. And um, there are some open problems as well. And let me just like giving give you the references. That's it. Actually, this was on archive yesterday. I put it tomorrow, but it was actually yesterday. Oh, cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much for this uh, very, very interesting talk. Any any questions? Question from audience? I have a couple of questions, but I... So any other, any questions? If no one asks, I'm gonna... Was it too technical? Maybe it was too technical, the talk. I don't no, know. no, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, Maybe I'll let me ask uh, some questions. Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, maybe one or two questions. I, I, if you have time, can we like yeah. chat a little bit? I don't want to hold everybody. Um, 